I guess for uh, all of us, if you've been in Christian ministry for any length of time, if you've been a Christian uh, for a length of time, you will have tragically and sadly seen people who professed faith in Christ, who seemed to be going on with the Lord, seemed to um, uh, sort of be enthusiastic about following the Lord Jesus, but who uh, somewhere uh, along the line have abandoned the faith and turned away uh, from uh, the faith. Um, we're all uh, familiar in church ministry and uh, church leadership with that uh, tragic uh, situation. But uh, it's also true that um, uh, there are leaders who uh, fall um, away. And in some sense, that's uh, perhaps even more uh, surprising and very often uh, shocking, uh, both to um, uh, Christians who have looked to them for leadership, um, also perhaps to leaders uh, for whom it brings home to them the possibility that they themselves uh, might uh, fall uh, away. So uh, even in this last year, there have been a number of high profile uh, leaders who have said that they have um, abandoned uh, the uh, Christian faith and become uh, uh, kind of atheists or unbelievers. So, for example, Joshua Harris, who used to lead Sovereign Grace Ministries in the United States, famous for his book, um, uh, I Kissed Dating Goodbye. Um, uh, uh, Marty Sampson, who was a, a worship leader with Hillsong, um, uh, both of them in the last year have uh, turned away from the faith and said that they're no longer believers. Uh, Bart Campolo, who is Tony Campolo's son, has also announced that he has become an atheist and has become quite a vociferous um, uh, atheist. Uh, there are other uh, uh, kind of high profile um, uh, sort of uh, people who um, uh, would have had a Christian faith in the past. So Bart Ehrman is one of the um, strongest critics of evangelical Christianity, arguing that the Bible is not reliable. He began as an evangelical Christian, but lost his faith and has then devoted his academic life to trying to undermine uh, the Christian faith. And then there might be those who've turned so far away from orthodox Christian beliefs that uh, in many ways it, it, it seems as though they have lost uh, their uh, faith. They no longer um, believe the fundamental convictions um, with which they began. You might think about people like Brian McLaren, who've moved further and further away from an evangelical understanding of the faith. What these leaders remind us is that none of us can take it for granted that we are immune from the danger of falling away. And uh, these might be leaders who've had an influence on us. Um, and uh, it's unsettled our faith to uh, hear that they have fallen away. So this is a really important issue uh, for us to think about um, as uh, leaders. But it's not just that um, uh, there are uh, leaders who have fallen away um, uh, that we know of, perhaps from our own um, experience. Um, this is also something that the Bible uh, speaks about um, through the Bible. Um, obviously, we read of many faithful leaders who make it to the end, who finish the race, who uh, complete um, uh, their service of God uh, faithfully. But the Bible also warns us of leaders who uh, seem to fall away uh, from uh, faith. Uh, we see that in the Old Testament. I think it's arguable that Saul is someone who appears to fall away uh, from uh, faith. Uh, he initially starts out professing uh, faith. He's obviously uh, chosen by God to be king, but he seems to progressively um, uh, fall away from uh, trusting uh, God at the end of his life. He even um, uses a witch to raise up the spirit of um, uh, sort of uh, Samuel. Saul is never held out as an example of faith. And in many ways, he stands as a contrast to David. Interestingly, both Saul and David sinned in various ways. The key difference is that uh, David always repented of his sin, whereas Saul again and again excused his sin and tried to um, avoid uh, blame. Uh, it seems to me that Solomon also is someone who, um, at the very least, is an example of someone losing their, the fervour of their faith, if not uh, moving um, into apostasy. Solomon, of course, began um, uh, seeking wisdom from God to lead and rule. But in the course of his life, he married many foreign wives. He worshipped foreign gods alongside the Lord. And again, he is never held up as an example of faith for uh, uh, God's uh, people. Perhaps more clearly in the New Testament, we see examples of those who fall away. So Judas, who starts out of one, as one of Jesus' disciples, but then ultimately um, rejects him and uh, betrays him, uh, is a paradigm example of apostasy. 
Again, it's worth um, contrasting Judas with uh, Peter. Uh, Judas betrays Jesus. Peter denies Jesus. Um, Peter repents. Um, even when he betrays Jesus, he breaks down in tears because he realizes um, uh, the wickedness of what he's done. And he is then restored. He doesn't apostatize, whereas Judas, in contrast, turns away from Jesus and does not repent and turn uh, back uh, to him. The uh, New Testament letters um, uh, speak uh, of those uh, who have turned away from the faith. So uh, Timothy grieves over um, various co-workers that uh, he has uh, sort of worked within the cause of um, the gospel who have um, at some point turned away from the faith and have actually um, undermined him and his ministry. So Demas, um, who has abandoned the faith too because he loves the world and he loves to be first. Alexander the metal worker who has turned against him, both mentioned in uh, 2 Timothy. And the book of the New Testament that deals with the issue of apostasy most is the book of Hebrews. The whole book of Hebrews is written uh, really about the issue of apostasy. Um, it's written to Christians from a Jewish background who are coming under increasing pressure um, from particularly um, the uh, Jewish community, uh, increasing persecution um, and social marginalization. So they're tempted to turn away from Christianity and turn back to um, Judaism. And uh, the whole letter of the Hebrews is really written as one long sermon to persuade them uh, not to commit apostasy, but to persevere in their faith and to keep trusting uh, the Lord Jesus. Now, the book of Hebrews is written to the whole church, but no doubt amongst those who are its attended audience, there are leaders who are in danger of abandoning the faith and returning to uh, Judaism. So um, not only do we know examples from church history, um, uh, from our own experience, but the Bible also warns us of the danger of those who have professed faith, even served in ministry or leadership, who uh, turn away uh, from uh, the faith. I guess that raises the question for us of why is it? Why is it that some people fall away from the faith? Why is it that uh, leaders uh, fall um, uh, uh, away? And it's helpful to recognize the variety of reasons that the uh, New Testament gives, the common reasons why it is that people abandon um, the faith. Perhaps uh, most significant here um, is Jesus teaching in Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 20, the well-known parable of the sower. As you'll know, the uh, parable of the sower describes how the sower, which is a picture of Jesus spreading the uh, word of God, sows the seed and it falls on different kinds of soil the path, the stony ground amongst the uh, weeds, and then on the good uh, soil. And uh, that is a picture of the way that different people respond to um, the word. So the uh, seed that falls on the path is, uh, is like um, when the gospel is preached and people make no response at all. On the stony ground, um, the gospel seems to kind of grow very quickly, seems to produce uh, a sort of an excited, positive response. But uh, when the sun comes up, the uh, plants shrivel and die. The um, uh, seed amongst the weeds seems to be growing, but it doesn't produce ultimately a harvest because um, it's crowded out by the weeds. And then, of course, the seed on the good soil grows and produces a great uh, harvest. I think that parable is a picture of um, the way that people fail to reach maturity, fail to um, endure and produce a harvest, even if they've apparently started out uh, with uh, Christian faith. So um, uh, the parable of the sower pictures something of the apostasy uh, that uh, occurs. Similarly, in the book of Hebrews that we've already referred to, the book of Hebrews warns of how people will commit a, a, a apostasy uh, and abandon the faith. Um, largely because of the uh, dangers of persecution and the cost involved of keeping uh, living for Jesus and uh, serving him. So take those together and there are a number of key factors that might lead to uh, somebody committing apostasy um, uh, according to the Bible, the things that influence them and that, that lead them astray. It, it might be false teaching. People who um, have been uh, uh, converted, have, have professed their faith, believe the gospel, but at some point they come into contact with false teaching that undermines their confidence or offers them uh, a, a, an alternative uh, sort of um, form of salvation. And uh, as a result, they abandon the faith they professed and adopt this new false teaching. That's what we see, for example, in the letter to the Galatians, 
by the Galatian Christians who responded to the gospel um, uh, are in danger of falling for the false teaching that says that they need to be circumcised in order to be saved. And Paul writes to them to warn them that if they adopt this false teaching, um, they'll be committing apostasy and they'll be turning away from uh, the Lord Jesus. So uh, it's the false teachers who have come in, maybe bringing them something novel and new, something they've never heard before, casting doubt on the teaching that they've received that causes them to give up potentially on uh, the gospel uh, faith. And uh, many people who have apostatized, it's often because of uh, false teaching that they've received that has cast doubt on the gospel um, that they uh, have uh, believed. Um, perhaps picking up particularly on the parable of the uh, sower, uh, the other uh, kind of common reasons for apostasy is because of suffering, because of um, persecution or hardship uh, in the Christian life. Perhaps people started out with enthusiasm in the Christian faith. They turned to Christ because they believed that he would make their life uh, better. He would make their life uh, blessed. He would rescue them from uh, difficulties and problems. And they discover in the Christian life that they begin to face uh, suffering and persecution for uh, the faith of Christ. Maybe they find themselves socially isolated. Um, uh, maybe they find themselves um, uh, turned away by friends and family. Um, in some cultures and countries, they suffer active persecution and some may even risk losing their life. Um, and uh, when suffering comes, they abandon the faith in order to avoid suffering um, and persecution. Uh, perhaps for others, it's distraction. Um, uh, they find uh, that there are other things that take the place of Christ. So um, uh, the parable of the sower speaks about the worries of this life, the uh, problems of just survival ev every day the alternative attractions of um, the world. Uh, very often people apostatize and turn away from the faith because they're tempted and they want to commit sin. And they know that sinning isn't consistent with being a Christian. So maybe they want to commit sexual immorality. Maybe they want to leave their wife and uh, be with somebody else. And so they justify their behavior by abandoning um, their uh, faith. They've been distracted um, uh, from faith in Christ. Uh, by uh, worry, or by the pleasures that uh, seem to be available uh, in uh, the world. Perhaps for others, they become disappointed. And I think this is often uh, the case with leaders, um, uh, that uh, perhaps as they uh, seek to uh, lead their churches, lead their ministries, they have high hopes and expectations of what God might do through them, of how they might be used by God. And over time, some of their hopes are disappointed. They don't see as much growth as they would like. Maybe they go through um, seasons of difficulty. They don't gain the respect um, uh, that perhaps they like. They compare themselves with other leaders and they feel inadequate. And that disappointment causes them ultimately to um, abandon uh, the faith. So those are just some of the common reasons um, uh, why people fall into um, uh, apostasy, why they um, uh, uh, abandon their faith and their trust uh, in Christ. And I would imagine we can all think of people who've fallen away, that where those factors um, have been um, uh, at work, sometimes uh, multiple factors are uh, uh, influencing a person to um, abandon uh, their uh, faith. And very often their abandoning their faith doesn't happen uh, all at once. It's often a slow and gradual uh, process. And often um, uh, it occurs secretly in the heart and um, only after a period of time do they publicly um, uh, make clear that they have lost their faith and are no longer uh, following Christ. So it's helpful to understand apostasy and what are the factors that cause apostasy, because that enables us to know how we can guard ourselves and guard others against this uh, danger. So what do we need to do if we're going to guard ourselves against the uh, danger of apostasy? Well, there are a number of things I think we ought to do um, and which the Bible urges us to do to help guard ourselves um, against uh, the danger of apostasy. First and most importantly, we just simply need to be aware of the danger. When perhaps we hear of people committing apostasy or when we read in the Bible of examples of, the, of apostasy, maybe we sort of think that will never happen to me. We might um, uh, see that it's happened to other people, uh, but we don't think that it will happen to um, us. 
And uh, I think that's a dangerous attitude um, to take. Um, there's a sort of a, 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 an arrogance uh, a, and confidence that is not appropriate. Um, we ought to at least all be aware of the danger uh, of apostasy and of giving up uh, on our faith. Of course, uh, we trust the promises of God. We believe that we have been genuinely converted, that God will uh, keep us. Uh, but that shouldn't take away from us a desire to want to uh, work uh, to try to avoid um, uh, falling into apostasy. We can't take for granted that there won't be challenges that will threaten our faith. So um, uh, we need to be aware of the danger rather than presuming that it will never be um, something that could happen uh, to us. Secondly, it's hugely important that we have realistic expectations of the Christian life. As I said, many of the reasons why people fall into apostasy is because they have unrealistic expectations of what the Christian life uh, will um, uh, be like. So, for example, maybe they've heard the gospel preached. Um, uh, maybe they've been convinced and convicted by it. And they've never, ever thought that there are um, uh, those who would uh, raise apologetic arguments to, for example, the truth of the Bible, uh, the truth of the resurrection. Um, uh, maybe there are moral issues they've never thought about. Um, uh, and when they suddenly come across those uh, questions, come across those uh, issues, it causes doubts that undermine their faith. We need to have realistic expectations. We don't know the answer to um, every uh, question. There will be um, uh, intellectual challenges that we face as uh, leaders. Um, and when we face those, we shouldn't um, instantly um, be knocked off course in our faith. Uh, we need to recognise that those are things that um, uh, we uh, need to think about, that we need to um, uh, read the Bible, that we need to talk to those who've already thought about those issues. And sometimes we have to recognise that, that there won't be an answer to a particular question um, uh, that maybe has been raised for it. Um, a, a simple uh, Christian faith doesn't mean that we're never going to have intellectual challenges that we have to address. Perhaps more importantly, the Bible is utterly realistic about the um, reality of persecution and suffering that are part and parcel of the Christian life. So Jesus teaching his disciples in John chapter 15, um, uh, in the upper room, uh, just before he was sort of uh, betrayed and arrested and executed, um, taught his disciples that they would be persecuted just as he had been persecuted. No servant is above his uh, master. In Acts chapter 14, verse 22, Paul um, uh, taught the, uh, uh, the Christians that they would have to pass through many troubles to enter into the kingdom of uh, heaven. We need to have realistic expectations of what the Christian life will be like. The Bible tells us that as Christians in this world, we are strangers and aliens. We don't belong to this world. People um, are hostile uh, to us. So those sufferings that come along should not be um, a surprise to it. Uh, it. It's not a surprise, is it, that um, uh, often people who have been um, brought up on the prosperity gospel, the idea that if only you believe and trust Jesus, um, uh, all of your problems will be resolved, you'll enjoy health and wealth and happiness, it's not surprising that for many, when those expectations are disappointed, they give up on uh, the faith. This is one of the reasons why it's so important that when we're sharing the gospel with people, we also speak about the cost of following Jesus and not just the blessings, because that helps people to have uh, realistic expectations. If those are, are sort of negative things, things that we need to um, uh, sort of uh, be aware of so that we can avoid them, the positive is to ensure that we keep on listening to the gospel so that we don't drift. Very often apostasy doesn't happen quickly and it doesn't happen intentionally. The book of Hebrews warns uh, the uh, readers uh, of the danger of drifting. The picture is um, uh, not of an active turning away from Christ, but of failing to keep listening to the gospel, to keep paying attention to what they've heard, to keep reminding themselves of the truth, with the result that they drift and uh, sort of wake up and find themselves far away from Jesus. So this picture of drift is a really helpful one. If we don't actively keep our faith strong by listening to the gospel and keeping reminding ourselves that the gospel is true, then the danger is that we might drift and uh, find that we have abandoned the faith. So Hebrews 2.1 uh, urges Christians to pay more careful attention to what it is that they've heard. They don't need a new message. 
They don't need a different gospel, but they need to keep listening to the gospel they've heard. And then um, uh, sort of to admit and deal with your doubts. Um, uh, inevitably, as Christians, as we go through life, as we confront challenges, um, we uh, face uh, doubts um, uh, that need to be uh, resolved. Um, and it's not wise to deny those doubts, to pretend that they aren't there or to suppress them. We need to uh, recognise them and then uh, seek to uh, deal with them, to see how they're answered by the uh, truths of uh, the gospel. Um, our, our faith uh, sort of needs to grow in strength. Um, uh, it's important to remember that um, we're saved by faith as small as a mustard seed, but we obviously want to grow to have strong faith. And in the course of our Christian life, There'll be times maybe in which our sort of faith is stronger and weaker um, and we need to be willing to openly admit to um, our doubts and deal for, with them. And I think that is a particular problem for leaders. Leaders feel very exposed and are often very reluctant to be honest about their struggles and their doubts. And so they don't get help when they need help. Um, uh, so perhaps they're ashamed or they're embarrassed or they're afraid uh, if they're struggling with various doubts. Um, uh, and if they fail to uh, deal with those issues, it can undermine their faith. Um, and it's rather like discovering that you've got symptoms of a disease. If you don't go to the doctor, if you don't go, uh, go and get help, uh, if you just leave it, it can get to the point at which the disease has become terminal. Whereas at an earlier stage, you could um, uh, have done something about it. The same is true of our temptations. So um, uh, if one of the reasons that we um, turn away from the faith is because uh, we're attracted to sin and want to um, disobey Jesus and live for ourselves, then again, admitting and acknowledging that we're facing temptation and getting help at an early stage is uh, crucial. And a little bit later in the forum, I'm leading um, a workshop on uh, fighting sin and temptation, which obviously closely connects uh, with this area. Well, we'll, we'll be thinking about how as Christians we can deal with and confront um, the uh, problem of uh, temptation. Well, uh, if we're to guard ourselves against the danger of apostasy, um, uh, then we equally need to be um, uh, prepared to help uh, and support uh, one another. Um, uh, obviously, this is a personal battle, but uh, we're part of uh, the church, we're part of God's family. We're not just uh, Christians uh, on uh, our own. Um, and therefore, we need to be um, able to help one another. And I think particularly to help one another as leaders to stand firm uh, in uh, our faith. And the Bible encourages us to uh, take action to help those who are perhaps drifting in their faith or who are in danger of um, uh, falling uh, away. So, um, uh, for example, in the letter of Jude, um, uh, Christians are urged to intervene to save those who they see uh, falling away. Jude uh, uses the very vivid picture of rescuing them from uh, the fire. They're in danger of uh, judgment if they turn away from Christ and sort of are, 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 are caught by the false teaching or drawn into temptation. And we've got a responsibility to rescue them uh, before it's too late to intervene, to step in. Similarly, um, uh, Jesus uh, taught in his parable of the lost sheep that uh, we're responsible to go and uh, find those who have uh, wandered astray. Now we often think that the lost sheep, particularly in Matthew chapter 15, is uh, all about the seeking of the lost, uh, evangelism um, and the rescue of uh, unbelievers. But in Matthew chapter 18 the picture is much more of rescuing Christians uh, members of the people of God who are in danger of wandering um, uh, astray and the uh, shepherd is to leave the 99 and go and find the uh, wandering uh, sheep just as God uh, found out. So there's a particular responsibility on leaders to be seeking for um, and after those who have wandered uh, uh, astray. So we're to take action um, to save and to rescue, to find and to uh, bring back. But the Bible is also realistic that sometimes there will be those who turn away from the faith and despite all of our best efforts, they don't repent, they don't return, they don't come back to uh, faith in the Lord Jesus. And uh, how does the New Testament understand that situation? How does it understand what has happened where a person has um, uh, professed faith in Christ, but then turned away from faith and they don't um, return 
uh, back to him. Well, uh, obviously this is an issue over which Christians have taken different views. Uh, it seems to me that the best way of understanding the New Testament teaching is to say that those who ultimately turn away and do not return and do not repent were never true believers in the first place. But yes, they professed faith in Christ. They did many of the things that believers might have done. They might even have been used of God because um, God is able to use uh, anyone. But the fact that they have abandoned the faith and they're no longer believing in Jesus and they don't repent and they don't return would suggest that they were never uh, his in the first place. The book of Hebrews warns uh, that for those who turn away from Christ and crucify him all over again, um, uh, there's uh, no uh, easy way back because they fundamentally rejected Jesus. Uh, in 1 John, John talks about those who've gone out uh, from John but, uh, uh, and his community, but who were never uh, really uh, with him, again, suggesting that they were never true um, believers. So I think that's helpful for us to uh, think about how we understand those who fall away and don't uh, come back. Well, where can you um, find help um, uh, in order to uh, avoid um, apostasy? We've talked about the need to uh, take this seriously and honestly, um, but where can we find um, uh, help if we're in danger of drifting, danger of falling away? Well, I think there are a variety of things that the Bible tells us um, we ought to do that will be helpful to us. First and most importantly, we need to pray, for Je pray to Jesus for grace in our time of need. Um, the uh, book of Hebrews, uh, again, encourages Christians to turn to Jesus. He is the great high priest who has died for our sins. He's um, uh, ruling and reigning at God's right hand. And uh, we can come to him to seek a grace in our time of need and temptation in our time of uh, need and uh, temptation. So um, uh, that is what uh, the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, the readers of the letter to the Hebrews needed to do. They were in temp danger of falling away because um, uh, of the uh, pressure of persecution and suffering. Um, and the author wanted them to know that Jesus was sympathetic. He uh, had been tested and tempted in every way that we are, which means that he understands. Um, and that he is able to supply the grace um, that we need. In other words, the strength to stand firm. So we can come to Jesus for help. We need to uh, keep our eyes fixed on the hope of heaven. So um, uh, many of the reasons that uh, we uh, are tempted to um, apostatize and fall away are because our experience in this world is difficult or unfulfilling. And uh, of course, for Christians, we don't live for life in this world. We think we, we're, we're passing through this world. We're strangers. We're aliens. We don't expect to find our happiness and our fulfillment here in this world. Not completely. We're looking ahead to the hope of heaven, to the new creation, when we will be with God and we will be with um, the Lord Jesus forever. Only then will we be fully freed from sin. Only then will we fully enjoy all of the blessings of belonging to God's kingdom. So uh, as we live in this world, we need to keep our eyes fixed on that hope. So Hebrews 12, 1 to 3 urges us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the uh, perfecter of our faith who has gone into glory. Romans 8 uh, urges us to keep our eyes focused on the uh, new creation to come. 2 Corinthians 14 reminds us that our troubles uh, in this world need to be seen in the perspective of the glory that awaits. 1 Peter 1 verse 7 reminds us that we have a glorious eternal inheritance that's kept safe for us because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So if we're living for this world and we expect all of our fulfilment and blessing in this world, we're likely to be disappointed. We will face suffering and so we need to keep our eyes fixed on the hope of heaven. And then of course we need to warn and encourage one another. We need to um, help each other to keep going, which means that we need to warn each other about the dangers of apostasy and keep urging one another not to abandon the faith, but also to encourage one another to uh, keep going in the faith, to remind one another that it is worth it and that we have that great eternal hope. So um, uh, uh, the author of the uh, letter to the Hebrews is warning the uh, Christians against the dangers of apostasy. He's honest uh, about how serious it is. Um, he wants to urge them to remain faithful because if they turn away from Jesus, there is no other hope for salvation. 
At the same time, he urges the Christians to keep on meeting together with one another in chapter 10, verses 25 and 26, so that they can uh, spur one another on to love and good deeds, so that they can keep going in uh, the Christian uh, faith. So we need um, to turn to Jesus for help. We need to um, uh, focus on the hope of heaven and we need to warn and encourage uh, one another. How do we um, treat those who do fall away? Well, I've mentioned already that um, uh, those who um, uh, have uh, not repented and returned, we need to uh, recognise we're probably never true believers in the first place. But something I think is important to recognise here is um, a particular danger is that there are people often in Christian leadership who have rejected or renounced the faith, but somehow seem to keep um, uh, remaining part of the church. So um, rather than uh, saying that they've abandoned the faith, they say they've redefined it or they've changed the faith. They essentially become liberals who no longer believe the gospel. Well, um, in that case, um, uh, the New Testament says that we need to make sure that we exercise proper church discipline and um, uh, that they no longer have a place in the life of the church and certainly no uh, role of leadership or teaching within the life of the church. So where people have abandoned the faith for the sake of the protection of the body as a whole, we can't pretend that they're still believers and that they can still exercise ministry in uh, the life of the church. Else otherwise, they will lead others astray. And very often the damage that's been caused to the church over the last 150 years is as a result of people who have abandoned the faith, but who have been able to continue to serve as church leaders, uh, theologians and teachers. And the result is that they've led many others uh, astray. So that's a, a, a kind of a brief overview of apostasy, uh, what it is, um, uh, why it happens, uh, how we can um, avoid it, uh, the uh, help that we get and how we should respond when people um, uh, fall um, uh, sort of from the faith. There are a number of books that I think are really helpful and again these are aimed particularly at uh, church uh, leaders to help leaders stay faithful in um, uh, sort of ministry. So um, uh, there I've just recommended a, a sort of a series of uh, sort of books that you might find helpful that will give you realistic expectations of what Christian leadership is like and help you to make sure that you keep going um, as a Christian uh, leader.